It's been 2,000 years since the glorious light of the cross illuminated a world veiled in darkness and confusion about the character of God. And still today, the greatest need of mankind is a revelation of God's love as revealed in the life of Christ. Amazing Facts presents the Everlasting Gospel with Pastor Doug Batchelor. Coming to you each week from Sacramento Central Church in sunny California. Discover hidden treasures in God's Word today. I think it's interesting as I watch all the attention that people put into weddings. Weddings aren't the same thing as marriage, as you realize. Uh, a lot of uh, marriages would be doing great right now if the wives put as much energy into the marriage as they did into the wedding. And a lot of marriages would be doing a lot better now if men put as much energy into the marriage as they do their work. But people are always looking for unique ways to get married. And I remember years ago I used to snorkel at the John Penny Camp coral reef off of the Florida Keys and it showed people getting married underwater in their scuba gear in front of the statue of Christ that they've got underwater. And I saw another one. Some people took what they call the vomit comet. Now they call it that because it's an airplane that produces the sense of weightlessness. And it flies up, I don't know how it must go, about 40,000 feet, and then it goes into a dive. It dives about the same speed that you would fall. So you have weightlessness for about 60 seconds, and then it goes back up again, and you can tell where it gets its name because some people get seasick in the process. But a lot of movies are shot when they want to create weightlessness in one of these 747s, or they even have 727s that do it. They go up and then they drop. And people pay thousands of dollars to just experience this for a few seconds. They get a few bouts of a weightlessness. Someone said, I want to get married in zero gravity. Because they knew how heavy marriage actually is. They wanted to, at least the wedding to be zero gravity. And then other people have done it parachuting, skydiving. Some people took their vows and then they bungeed off a bridge. And uh, people are, you know, think about fun ways, something unique that no one has ever done before. Uh, someone eventually get married at the International Space Station. Mark my words. It'll happen someday. People think it's, you know, want to do something creative with the wedding. But we really don't have as much problem with the weddings as we do with the marriages. Some people spend a lot of money on a wedding. And they think that'll somehow guarantee a good marriage. Uh, some weddings are real expensive. How many of you remember when... Uh, Prince Charles and Princess Di got married. It was what you call a royal wedding. I'd never even heard what the price tag on that was, but I'm sure it was millions and millions of dollars. But even private weddings. Uh, a few years ago, I read that uh, David Guest and Liza Minnelli, their wedding cost $3.5 million. Uh, they're divorced today. Ugly divorce. Paul McCartney and Heather Mills, their wedding, $3 million the retired beetle. Uh, you probably heard in the news that didn't end well either. I mean, she got a lot more than what the wedding costs, I think. Brad Pitt, Jennifer Aniston, their wedding only cost a million dollars. If they'd spent more, they'd still be married, right? Was that the problem? Lives locally, I understand. Eddie Murphy, Nicole Mitchell, a few years ago, 1.5 million on the wedding. But that's not the most expensive. In history, the most expensive wedding was in 1981. Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid got married and he spent in 81 $44.5 million on his wedding. By today's standards, that would be $100 million. That's more than Princess Di and Prince Charles spent on theirs, you can be sure. They're still married. So, there you've got it, friends. You just got to spend $100 million <laughs> on your wedding and you won't have any problems. Is that where the uh, problem is? No, and then you and I know the stories of grandma and grandpa that got married and, and uh, spent $25 for the justice of the peace and they're still married. My grandmother and grandfather got married. She was 16, he was 19. Uh, did they make it to 70 years, dear? 72 years. 
Then they divorced and had affairs. No. <laughs> no, they stuck it out the whole life. And you know, I never forgot what my grandma used to say. She says, I just married him. She'd say this right in front of him. She said, I just married him because I wanted to get out of the house. <laughs> she said, no, we didn't love each other. We didn't know what love was. But she says, we learned to love each other. Amen. And I never forgot that she impressed upon me that it doesn't matter whether or not you feel like it, you're committed to love. And boy, they used to have some doozies of fights. She chased him through the house throwing things. <laughs> That's my Jewish grandma. May they rest in peace. I can say that now. But uh, they were committed, they loved each other, and they would work things out. There's an epidemic of divorce. Do I need to tell anybody that? Matter of fact, it's hard to gather statistics for this because so many people live together without even getting married now that it muddies the statistics. But right now, North America, about 48% of first marriages end in divorce. You might be thinking, well, maybe what I need is a second marriage. 65% of second marriages end in divorce. Third time must be the charm, right? 73% of third marriages end in divorce. Uh, would you like to hear some of the reasons? Financial problems? I wonder if the crisis today has exacerbated that. Primary reasons for divorce. Inability to manage and resolve conflict. Infidelity. Somebody's been unfaithful. Cultural and lifestyle differences. There's added challenges when people marry people from a whole different culture uh, where they operate differently and different customs. That can be a challenge. Lack of communication between spouses. Abandonment. Alcohol or drug addiction. Physical abuse. Emotional abuse. These are the reasons that are cited by the uh, agencies that did the research. Personality differences, irreconcilable differences, differences in personal and career goals, different expectations about household tasks, different expectations about rearing children, interference from parents or in-laws, lack of maturity, intellectual incompatibility. Some have listed sexual incompatibility. Instances of sticking to traditional roles, not allowing for personal growth, falling out of love. Have you heard that one before? It's like you tripped and fell in love and you climbed out. <laughs> religious conversion or religious beliefs. Some people get converted and because of the religious, they say, look, I didn't buy into this. And I know people who have been divorced because um, they got baptized, their spouse left them. Mental instability or mental illness, criminal behavior and incarceration for a crime. That could, you know, some your spouse gets puts away for a number of years. That could be difficult. Inability to deal with each other's petty idiosyncrasies. Counselors compiled the list, some of the reasons that people get divorced. But uh, God hates divorce. He wants us to make a commitment for life. For the Lord God of Israel says He hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now I don't want to diverge into the problem of divorce. That might be the topic of another sermon, but I, I'll say just a word more. You know, a lot of people, even in the time of Christ, the Jews had made some concessions in the law for divorce. It had gotten so bad that they had a law that said that if a woman burned her husband's food, he had grounds for divorce. And so they just kept widening and widening those excuses like we're doing today. So Jesus said, there's only one grounds for divorce, and that's for fornication. That means marital infidelity. Otherwise, it was a commitment for life. It was to be taken very seriously. It's the foundation of a culture. Amen. You know, they're building a new building, New York City, on the spot where the... Um, the Twin Towers were. They're calling it the Freedom Tower. It's going to be the tallest building in North America, 1,776 feet. 1,776, that's interesting. Freedom Tower. Foundation goes down about seven stories in absolute bedrock. 
They're going to have a principal area in the middle for memorials. So that's one of the things is you need a foundation and you need to have memor memorials from the ground up about what you're committing to when you get married. Amen. Marriage is a covenant. Amen. And I dare say that a lot of people don't want God to keep their salvation covenant with them the way they're keeping their covenants with their spouse. God makes a covenant to save us. Do you want him to keep his covenant? Are we going to keep our covenants? How important is the promise? When you make a vow in the presence of God, can you explain to me some vow that is of more weighty substance than a vow made in the presence of God? Now having said all this about divorce and the epidemic of divorce, uh, there are even times, happened to me this morning, where I was approached by a member, remain anonymous, spouse is living with somebody else, they've been abandoned, there's adultery, and they said, you know, do I have, is it time to divorce? I said, it may be. Even pastors recognize biblically there are times. We're also not saying that the Bible says that divorce is the unpardonable sin, but it can be. Did you hear me? I'm not saying that there, it automatically tells us that divorce, that is the unpardonable sin. By the way, God told Abraham to divorce Hagar. Part of the reason is he had too many wives. You're only supposed to have one, right? At least one at a time. He had two at the same time. So uh, I know there's a lot of people statistically, you've read the statistics, there's people in this congregation. Unfortunately the statistics among Christians aren't much better than the world at large. It's not the unpardonable sin, but you better recognize that unless you've got solid biblical grounds, it is sin. And you are not free to run off and get remarried, according to the Bible. It tells us that uh, we are one flesh when we get married. Matthew 19, verse 6, So then Jesus said, They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. It's a union formed and recognized and registered by God in heaven should not be separated here on earth, especially for the grounds that uh, are often cited. First miracle of Jesus, first miracle of Jesus was at a wedding. That tells us something about how he prioritizes that. Even though Christ himself was not married to a person, in spite of the stories you hear from the Da Vinci Code, no, he did not have an affair with Mary Magdalene. Christ was married to the church. She is the bride of Christ. Many people dismiss marriage today. It's outdated. I mean, after all, we've evolved. And since chimpanzees are not all monogamous, then it's understandable that we should bounce from one relationship to another. That's one of the dangers of evolution. It's giving people excuses. It says, you know, why would we be constrained? People are trying to shake off the shackles of marriage. And since there is such a... loose and reckless sexual behavior in our society right now. Everyone used to believe that intimacy and sex was to be reserved only for that marriage relationship. And since it's like shaking hands in our culture now, that's the way the television portrays it, that if you talk about living a chaste life until marriage, they think, oh, that's so antiquated. How can anyone really live like that? But if we really understood that it is a sacred covenant, and that uh, intimacy is reserved for marriage, we'd uh, treat marriage with more reverence. They become one flesh. It's in the marriage relationship that happens. They're joined together. Children are exhibit A of the one flesh. A man and woman become one flesh. Their genes unite in that child. They procreate. It's a way in which we are made in the image of God. God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit said, let us make man in our image. And because of the love of God, man was made. Because of the love between a husband and wife, they procreate in their own image. It's a miracle when you think about it. God's plan. Marriage is God's plan. Now, it may not work out that way for some people, but God says it's not good for a man that he should be alone. I'll make a helper for him. King James says a help meet for him. That doesn't mean you get married to help meet expenses. 
It means that we are complete in, in some ways. You ever notice how opposites attract? Uh, that happens in so many relationships and uh, it, it's almost, I used to wonder if it was a cosmic joke that God was playing on couples. That the very things that they seem attracted to in their, their spouse, they're opposite. Those same areas that attracted them end up becoming the problems in the marriage. And uh, it's usually because God made men and women differently and they are to complement one another and we are to strengthen each other in the weak part. So together, if we're united, we become strong. But if we continue to live in our own worlds, then you have those, uh, a lot of the challenges arise from that. Some of you maybe heard the story of Robinson Crusoe based on a true story about someone by the name of Alexander Selkirk who was put off an English ship on an island there called Juan Fernandez where he lived by himself, well actually with a bunch of cats and rats and goats on this island for four and a half years. And uh, when they finally rescued him, another ship stopped there and they found him there. He was kind of babbling. They could hardly understand him. And um, he had become a little bit goofy living by himself. He become eccentric. He was talking to the goats when they finally picked him up. Some of you are thinking, my marriage isn't a lot better than that. <laughs> God intends for us to be balanced by marriage. It teaches you to love. You know, our principal challenge in the plan of salvation, God is trying to teach us to love. And love relationships are where we have a challenge. We learn to love and be selfless in, begins with the home, with the husband and the wife, and then through the children. We learn to deny ourselves and to prefer others. Most divorces, if not 100%, somebody is being selfish. It's almost always because someone is making selfish decisions. If there was more choice of love, you'd see more harmony in the relationships. I'm going to interpret your silence, not that you're sleeping, but that you're listening. They become one flesh. The Bible says in Amos chapter 3, 3, can two walk together unless they're agreed? It's so important that we can be one in our goal of Christ. If we've got that at the center, there's great hope. Now, Chuck Swindoll wrote in his book, The Great Awakening, he did years as a pastor counseling, that um, Karen and I read a book together before we got married by, uh, I just remember his last name was Harley, like Harley Davidson, and I think you can still get this. It's called His Needs, Her Needs, a very good book, very eye-opening, almost the same data. The needs of the wife are unique to the needs of the husband. Number one need that women express, affection. Secondly, conversation, communication. Third, honesty, openness. Fourth, financial support. Fifth, family commitment. Five major needs that men expressed. Number one, sexual fulfillment. Number two, recreational companionship. Number three, an attractive spouse. Number four, domestic support. Number five, admiration, respect. Look how different they are. Is there any wonder we're having problems? You've heard the story, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. It is like sometimes the people get married and a couple weeks after the honeymoon, they think, who is this alien? Because the, the needs and the expectations are so different and that's what leads to the conflict. And you know, it's part of the salvation process, part of our conversion process is learning to love in a marriage. We thought all the love came before. Most of the time it's attraction and lust before. The real love begins to demonstrate itself after the wedding. That's when the real work begins. Now I'm going to go through some points. And I've compiled this. <laughs> I was going to name this sermon, Pastor Bachelor Talks About Marriage. <laughs> sort of be a pun. But I'm going to share with you what I've learned and others... Um, resources I've read that sort of summarizes what some of the tips are to having a healthy marriage. And I need to issue a disclaimer. Wife sitting in the audience, I'm not saying this because I'm an expert in any of these areas. I'm saying it because you need to hear it, <laughs> whether I'm a good example or not. Amen? Okay, so we're all in this together, all right? Commitment. 
Number one, there needs to be a commitment. From the beginning, you say, I'm getting married and we're going to make this work no matter what. And as soon as you get married and there's so much evidence for divorce in our culture, we're always thinking, well, there's that window, there's that escape hatch. Lock the hatch. Don't leave it as an option. As soon as you start thinking about that, you will start looking beyond that, thinking, oh, the grass might be greener somewhere else, then you're in trouble. You made a promise, you're married, this person. Marriage is a commitment for life. It's supposed to be till death do you part. A couple was getting married, little boy was at the wedding. He's looking, he asks his mother, why is the girl wearing all white? Mom said, that's because it's the happiest day of her life. He said, why is he wearing black? <laughs> it's not because a marriage is a funeral. It's supposed to be happy. But it'll be a lot happier when you're committed. You know what? I think that there's a lot of restlessness and unhappiness in marriages there shouldn't be because people in the back of their minds have not really put all of their weight down and said, this is the person I am in a lifeboat. There is no other lifeboat just with this person. We've got to get along. We've got to make it work because you jump over their sharks, you, you realize that there's no other option. And as soon as you remove all other options, it's amazing how much better you can learn to get along if you stop leaving those escape hatches open in the back of your mind. It's a commitment for life. Amen? For this cause... A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Cleaving means you, they're, they're glued. It's talking about just m much more than the intimacy. It's a picture of closeness, openness, no hidden agendas, honest. Someone said marriage is more like running a farm than running a sprint. You got to start over every day, seven days a week. You don't get a Sabbath from marriage. You don't get a Sabbath from a farm. You got to still milk the goats or the cows or whatever, right? Well, you still do. You get some kind of Sabbath on a farm. It's something you got to do every day. And so it's this commitment. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. You know, I like that verse you find in Ruth. And I've often used it when I do weddings. When Ruth uh, said, I'm going to follow with you, Naomi, wherever you go. Just this commitment. She said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whether you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God my God. Where thou dwellest, I will, where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more aught, and more also, if aught but death part you and me. Nothing should separate us. There's a commitment there. You notice it says, where you go, I will go. Sometimes people say, well, yeah, dear, I got to travel more because after all, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, there's another adage. It's called out of sight, out of mind. That also happens too. I think it's important that you got to stay together as often as possible. Now, in our family, I have to travel a lot. As frequently as I can, we take trips as a family. Sometimes just Karen can go. Frequently take the boys because it's important that you don't spend too much time apart. That's uh, often what thins the relationship out. Commitment. Next, forgiveness. Marriages are made in heaven. So is thunder and lightning. There can be challenges. You've got to learn to forgive each other. Someone said one time, a girl was talking to her friend, and she said, uh, I knew when I got married, he was Mr. Right. I just didn't know his first name was Always. <laughs> he always thinks he's right. You've got to learn how to admit you're wrong. You need in marriage, if you want to get along, you've got to learn how to apologize even when you think you're right. Do you, is there anything wrong with that? I mean, there's no inconsistency there. You can apologize and not concede the point that you were making. And it's amazing how many trivial things that couples argue about you know, there are some things that are really weighty matters, but uh, you, you know, I got another point that will deal with that. Ephesians 4.26, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. You know, and this is one reason a lot of couples struggle. Something happened, and they never really settled it and forgave each other and moved on. Or 
one spouse keeps reminding the other spouse about something they did years ago and you got to know how to park those things, dig a hole, put it in, bury it, and don't dig it up anymore. You have a funeral. Say, that's forgiven, that's over. You're not allowed to bring that up anymore. And uh, it, it, a lot of couples, you know, they just feel like they've run out of ammunition. Instead of communicating, they figure, oh, they said something to hurt me. I'm going to have to dig up my old resources here. And throw that back. And that'll, you know, and it's like instead of communicating, it becomes who can throw the biggest missiles so that they get even. Forgive. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. At the end of every day, keep short accounts. How quickly does God forgive you when you ask Him? Ask Christ has forgiven you, so you ought to forgive one another. Oh, but it hurts so much. You think that your spouse hurt you more than you hurt Jesus? It killed Him what you did. So we need to learn to forgive each other. There's nothing worse than people going through a relationship where there's this constant bitterness. It's almost like rust and fungus on the relationship because they can't just ask for the grace of God to forgive and really let it go. You can choose to forgive even though you may still have it in your mind. You may not control what you remember. You can choose to forgive and say we're going to move on from here. I heard about uh, one old timer who's married 60 years in Texas and someone asked him to what do you attribute your long and happy marriage? He said, well my wife and I resolved never to go to sleep until we settled any differences. He said, of course there were weeks when we didn't sleep. <laughs> but you gotta let it go. Ben Franklin said, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterward. You need to apologize when we've done wrong. Be forgiving with your partner. You'll be faced with tough times. You'll have to choose between forgiving him and her when a mistake happens um, or carrying it on forever in the marriage. Patience. Now these are related. Be patient with each other. And uh, Galatians 5 verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, you know these, love, joy, peace, patience. Here is the patience of the saints. Ignore the small stuff. And you know, I'm doing better. I used to, sometimes the delay, I'm just talking about plain old delay, waiting, used to irritate me. And I'm getting now where I'm thinking, just enjoy yourself while you wait. And, and just be patient. But that's not the patience. We need patience with each other in our relationship as we grow to become like Christ, that doesn't happen in one day. So you need to have patience that may take years. Be patient. In the same way, are you glad God's patient with you? Are you everything Christ wants you to be? You want Him to continue being patient with you? Do you want Him to give up on you the way sometimes spouses give up on each other? We need to pray that God will give us that grace and patience in our relationships with one another. Luke 21 verse 19, by your patience possess your souls. Now you've heard it said before, never seek to change the other person for their flaws. Change yourself. Well, I don't buy into that cliche completely. There are things in me that I'm hoping Karen can help me change. I mean, we, let, let's be honest. You should never get married thinking, well, I'll change that later. If you're th planning on changing people, no, don't go into it that way. But we need to be willing to help each other grow. Part of that is communicating about the, the areas of weakness. But the main thing you can do is you can change yourself. Sometimes there's a lot of friction in relationships because one is trying to control the other. And that's just, the, you know what happens typically? Is if there's something where I'm sort of pushing indirectly against Karen because there's something I want her to change, she senses that and she pushes back the other way. There's like a resentment that you're being manipulated. Pray for each other. Be a good example. Change yourself is what that's saying. Uh, my favorite philosopher, Anonymous, once said, Many girls marry men just like their fathers, which explains why many mothers cry at weddings. I wanted to share that. Which brings me to my next point. Have a sense of humor. You need to be able to laugh together in your relationship. You should enjoy each other's company. You know one of the one, 
number one things that women look for in a man? Sense of humor. They're, they're looking for somebody. That was the only thing I had going for me uh, when, when Karen married me. <laughs> you need to be able to laugh together. And you know what? Sometimes when there is tension, if you can still laugh together over these crises that come and the problems, it just relieves, it creates a vent in your relationship if you know how to laugh. Uh, in spite that things may not be perfect, if you can still laugh together. I know this week, um, Karen, I hadn't heard her laugh so hard. Of course, it was at my expense. But uh, <laughs> we have a hose by our front door that we use for, you know, watering the flowers and stuff out front. Well, the hose was about 30 years old. I don't know. It finally, it got old. And it had a big aneurysm on it. But, you know, I wanted to save money, so I've been just leaving it like that and hadn't really thought about it. I, I knew I should have gotten new hose, but I thought, oh, you know, let's see how long it goes. It is just kind of looked like a boa constrictor that had swallowed a little raccoon or something. And uh, I went out to water one day, uh, and I sprained the water by the front door where it's all coiled up, and I went and pressed the trigger, and instead of the water coming out of the trigger, all of a sudden, I just got sprayed. My whole body just got sprayed with water, and it sprayed the front door and everything, and and I just totally doused. Where well, I walked over to where Karen was, and, and I told her, I said, you know, I went to water the plants, and I just got splattered. Well, she started laughing so hard. She thought that big, one of those deep, loud belly laughs. <laughs> and she, I said, what's so funny? She said, that happened to me. And she didn't tell me. She wanted it to happen to me also. <laughs> <laughs> we now have a new hose by our front door. <laughs> but see, you need to be able to laugh, and you need to be able to laugh at yourself. Sometimes if you do something funny or something happens like that and your spouse laughs, don't get mad. You learn to laugh at yourself. Laugh with each other. Sometimes it's almost like we're laughing at each other and someone else resents it and just, you know what, humble yourself. Often these problems come in and there's arguments and there's anger because of pride is offended. Just humble yourself and laugh together and laugh with each other. We need to have humor in our relationships. There needs to be honesty. This is very simple and straightforward. Um, that doesn't mean you need to say everything you're thinking to your spouse. Sometimes people say, well, I tell my spouse whatever I'm thinking, and, uh, you know, I don't hide anything. Well, you need to have good judgment. Don't say everything you're thinking. But what I'm talking about, honesty, as soon as husbands and wives start keeping secrets from each other, start hiding things, start hiding conversations and, and uh, relationships. Um, that's when problems come in. Start their own bank account. Take trips and don't say where they're going. Like Argentina. <laughs> that can't be right. Not even the same hemisphere. You need to be open and honest in relationships. And you know, you, you need to be friends. You don't hide things from your friends. Your spouse ought to be your best friend. If you start out, you know, men typically when they're looking for a wife, they're often looking for someone who's attractive. That's usually top on the list. There's other things. Women are often looking for security. But if the main thing you're looking for is someone that you just, are, they're your best friend. You can be friends with them then everything else becomes a lot easier. So there needs to be that honesty. Work together. Share chores. Um, they're around the house and stuff, and we do that. And you know, there's some things that in our family, I almost uniformly do or always do, and there's some things that Karen almost always does. Uh, she almost always does the laundry, probably almost 100% of the time. And then there are, you know, there's hard work around there. All you guys will tell you a tip. If you want to work that out, you do the laundry once and pour bleach in instead of soap. <laughs> They'll never ask you again. Just a little tip for you. <laughs> Break a few dishes. They won't ask you to wash them anymore. It's got to be the wedding china, though. No, I help with dishes. But uh, you, know, you need to find things you can do together. And Karen and I, we might weed together and, and do dishes together. And, but there's something where you need to work side by side. We'll cut word, wood together. And it's fun when you can spend time doing things, sharing the chores. There's a lot of res responsibilities. And you know, one of the principal things, you'd be surprised, a lot of marriages fall apart because a lot of the burden around the house is all left on one spouse. 
The other one just kind of roams in and out and just throws everything around and someone else is left with a job of doing all of the chores of life and teach the kids to work. That helps too. Which leads into another important point in a happy relationship. Express appreciation when you are doing work for the things that are done. You know, sometimes I would kibitz a little bit because I'd say, oh, the dishes have been here for 24 hours. And uh, then Karen will work real hard one day. I come back from work and everything's immaculate in the kitchen. I don't say anything. And she said, look, did all those dishes from dinner last night? Everything's clean. You never say anything. I said, I'm trying to look. I, you go around and say, oh, yeah, thank you, dear. I really do appreciate it. Express appreciation. And you know, wives, men need to hear, you think it's your job to go to work. You've been doing it every day. It helps to hear them say, men like to hear, you know, I appreciate that you do work, even if it's been the same job for 20 years, I appreciate that you work so hard, that you do provide for the family, that you do sometimes, instead of complaining that the husband has gone too much, and that's another area that needs to be worked on, sometimes they're gone because they're providing. And they always feel like all I'm hearing is that we don't have time together, but are you well provided for? Uh, you know, are, are we fed? And even might be in debt, but the basics are covered. Express appreciation. Both husband and wife need to hear that. Show that you care. Who was it? Uh, Agatha Christie, that famous mystery author. Someone asked her, why did you marry an architect? She said, I don't know. I should have married an archaeologist. Archaeologists are great because the older you get, the more interested they are in you. <laughs> Joe Murray said it well. Marriages should be a duet. One sings, the other claps. And uh, how many of you husbands and wives have heard your spouse tell the same story a hundred times? And you still got to look adoring and interested every time, right? So... Show love. Where am I? I got another point here or two. Quality time. You know the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 5, when a man has taken a new wife he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He will be free at home one year and will bring happiness to his wife who he has chosen. God knew, especially during the first year of marriage, how important it is that there's quality time together. And, uh, you know, we call it the honeymoon, and after that week or weekend together, whatever you can afford, you come home and say, now we're going to get into the business of life or finish school, whatever's going on. And couples start growing apart just because of the pressures of life. Uh, sometimes children come earlier than expected, and the husband has to work harder, and the wife is busy, and there's a lot of pressures that come in. You've got to reserve that time. You know, one of the biggest, uh, I believe one of the biggest enemies of the family in marriages is, is television. Some of you are thinking, well, if it wasn't for TV, we'd never spend time together. Are you really spending time together? I remember when Karen and I started dating, she used to say, I don't know why some couples go to movies for their date. You don't really communicate. You sit there in the dark, surrounded by strangers. You don't talk, and then you walk out, and you might talk about the content of the movie, but... Uh, you know, it seems like a strange way to spend a date. I still remember one of the best dates we had. We went to a park. It didn't cost anything. We laid on the grass in a park. I don't know, maybe we had a blanket. And we laid with our feet out away from each other and our heads together. By the way, that avoids temptation. So I had my head on her shoulder and she had her head on my shoulder. It's like our ears are touching. She just cracked up. She thought that was hilarious. And we laid and we talked using each other's shoulders for pillows. And uh, you, you communicate. You spend time together. I remember we assembled, uh, during that list, during that um, date, we assembled a pro and con list to our getting married. That's pretty scary. I don't know, did you save that? <laughs> <laughs> Quality time. Listen to this. In an article by Dr. Dr. Armand Nikolai, he is the psychiatrist for the med a medical doctor on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Another trend that is going to destroy the family as we know it and cause emotional cripples is the invasion of television into the home. One-fifth of the lifetime of the next generation will be spent watching television. If you live to be 80 years of age, 
if that's your average, you will have watched television a total of 4,000 days. 4,000 days. And we wonder why people don't have any quality time. Before electricity and artificial entertainment, people had to talk. That's why marriages, I think it was only like one out of 32 got divorced 100 years ago. Now 46%. Or what did I say, 42%. It varies from state to state, by the way. It's worse in California than Minnesota. This create, creates a tremendous impact. And since we know television is part of the system, and system is to tear down the family, you'll have a total of 4,000 days of anti-family propaganda. This idea of marriage being between two men or two women. You don't get married, you just live together. Where did that get introduced into our culture? Where do you think the principal channel was that poured that idea into our culture? It's the movies and television, breaking down our, our values. And um, it does have an impact on the family. Establish your own home. The Bible says, and I've read this before, therefore a man will leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Uh, one of the principal reasons that people get into trouble in their relationships is they're living with the couple gets married, but the sister is still in the house. Or mom and dad are in the house. And I know that there are cultures and there are situations where that might seem unavoidable, but that compounds the pressures of these two people from completely different backgrounds. They think they got a lot in common, but you just wait until they start like sharing a kitchen uh, or a bathroom sink. That's where the challenge is. I mean, the couples have argued about which place you squeeze the toothpaste. And when you unroll the toilet paper, well, in our family growing up, we always had it where the roll hung on the outside of the roll. You got it coming down by the wall. They keep flipping it around, and it causes a civil war. And you had no idea that that would be a, a point of contest. But you had no idea dating that anything like that would ever come up. But you've got all these things you've grown up with that are so different, your understanding and your view of life, and you've got to meld those together. If you've got the compounded challenge of having additional family in the roof, under the roof, that can really be uh, difficult. Who was it? Uh, Larry Cunningham was visiting some friends one time and, and uh, got a phone call from their daughter, newlywed. She called and she's having her first marital spat. And she complained and cried to her father and he came back to the dinner table and they said, what was all about? And she said, well, our daughter got married. She's having her first problem. Well, what'd she say? Oh, well, she wants to come home. What'd you say? I said, I told her you are home. <laughs> You're with your husband. You're not coming home. That is your home. And so you form a new unit. You form a new home and you've got to realize that is it. There's no going home. You become a new home when you get married. And then there needs to be love in the relationship. That's a choice. Like my grandma, my grandpa, they said we had to learn to love each other. It's something you choose to do. Do you think when Jesus died for us that we were lovable? Or did he just love us? Because we're his creation. When you get married, you make a choice to create a new family, to love doesn't mean that your spouse is always going to behave lovable. But you've decided to love. And you really can choose to love. Whenever you're tempted to be impatient and you choose to wait, you're choosing to love. <coughs> when they've done something that hurts you, but they've asked for forgiveness, you may not feel like it. it. still bothers you, but you choose to forgive, you've chosen to love. Yeah. When you're tapping your foot because they're late and you wait a little longer, that's love. When you feel like complaining as soon as he comes home because something went wrong or broke during the day, but you say, I'm going to wait until he gets acclimated. He needs some quiet time. You're choosing to love. Whenever you consider the other person's need first instead of yours, love is the opposite of selfishness. Why are there so many divorces? Too much selfishness. What's the problem? More love. Instead of thinking about ourselves, think about the others. And that's what it means to be a Christian. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He denied himself and did what we needed instead of what he needed. 
And that's the key really to happiness in our families, not just between husband and wife. That's the key to happiness in our churches. It's that love. Then, of course, oh, I, I read this. I thought I want to share this with you. E.J. Graff said, marriage is when you agree to spend the rest of your life sleeping in a room that's too warm besides somebody who's sleeping in a room that's too cold. <laughs> we got that in our family. Devotions. It's uh, an old cliche, but it still is true. The family that prays together stays together. You need to have regular time for personal and family prayer. You show me a family that is neglecting prayer, individual devotions, and then collective devotions with the children. Regular time where you, you read something together from God's Word or a Christian devotional, and you pray together. Everybody's so, everybody's so busy today in this culture that uh, we forget some of the basics. Uh, and it's good, I believe, that men should lead out. And uh, sometimes the wife is a little more gregarious and outspoken, a little more natural in that respect, but she should encourage the husband to be the priest of the family. I heard about um, a woman that was talking to a room full of women about marriage. And she said, how many of you want to mother your husbands? And in the back, one lady raised her hand. And she was surprised by that because it was a rhetorical question. And she said, you want to mother your husband? She said, oh, mother, I thought you said smother. <laughs> we need to have family devotions. If dad is traveling, then mom, of course, should lead out in those situations. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For no other foundation can man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is the foundation for our marriages, for our homes? It's got to be Christ and His Word. This is the rock. Christ said, He that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man that builds his house on a rock. If the Word of God is the foundation, and by the way, God is love. The Ten Commandments are on a rock. It's all about love God and loving one another. If love is the foundation for your home, for your marriages, then you'll be able to work things out. Amen. Now, I, I hope that you'll find that this is relevant for everybody here. Um, there's a lot more I could say. Maybe I need to do a part two for this. Because there really is a need for us to learn to love each other. If, how are we going to witness to the world? Christ said, all men will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. The Bible says, love your enemies. If we're struggling loving our spouses, how are we going to witness to the world? How are we going to fulfill the Great Commission? Where is the best place for us to begin to fulfill the Great Commission? loving family. You know, the first Christian couple that I really, that studied with me, a man that baptized me, I spent time in their home. They'd been married 50 years by the time I knew them. And I saw how they loved each other. And that made such a big impact on me. Uh, their commitment, their patience, their love, their humor. These uh, lists, this list of uh, tips that I've been talking about, that impressed me. My grandparents, that impressed me. You know, and this is an important subject to me. My mother was married four times, 20 years lived with somebody she wasn't married to. My father was married five times. And with that kind of baggage in my background, it was very important to me that marriage work. I wanted to be more like my grandparents. And I, I see that it can happen, friends. And it, if it should happen anywhere, it should be happening in Christian churches, right? We've got to make that decision that we want to represent Jesus. If we decide that the glory of God is first, that we're going to honor God, we're not going to live for ourselves, we're going to do what Christ wants us to do. Even though sometimes marriage may seem like a cross that you bear, if you're glorifying God and you're witnessing for Him, then you choose to love and you bear it. You've made a promise. Now, I'm not suggesting that marriages should be something to endure to the end. It should be something that should be enjoyed, right? But even if it does mean endure, 
we need to stick together. There'll be days where you will enjoy it. And so there needs to be that kind of commitment right from the beginning. And it all goes back to love. Love in our homes, love in our hearts. You know, I change the rules. I know it says in your bulletin that we were going to be singing um, hymn number 579. Disregard that. During Sabbath school, they were singing f uh, 652, Love at Home. And I thought, boy, that really goes better with the sermon than what I picked. So why don't you turn to that with me? Let's sing this together. Love at Home. Isn't that what we're praying for? Number 652, and let's stand together as we sing. You know, uh, one of the reasons I picked this song is that last line there, time doth softly, sweetly glide when there's love at home. You know, that conjured up an image in my mind of trying to move something along, uh, just grinding, pushing, resistance. I remember one time trying to push a heavy load, and a friend said, Doug, take a pipe put a pipe under it. It was on a concrete floor. We lifted up one end and we put a pipe under it and I could push it with one finger. It just glided across the floor. Love is the grease in our relationships. When there's love, when we choose to love, it's something that you'll enjoy. Without that, it's going to be something you endure. And so we need to ask God to just give us that love. How many of you want to have love in your homes, in your marriages? Let's sing verse 2. I've been just praying as we sang that last verse, thinking, Lord, I want to make an appeal, but I'm not even sure what to say. But I'd like to give people here an opportunity to respond. And this could apply to everybody. If you might be single, be praying about marriage. You might ask for special prayer right now. Some of you have great marriages and you want them to be even better. You might have some special need. Others are struggling, and you know it's selfishness, and you want to have more love. You might want to come forward. You may want to just stay where you are and, and pray. God will uh, bless you in your home. But I just want to open up the, uh, the front of the church right now. This can be an altar. And you know that your family's not had Christ as the center. Or maybe um, 
you've been neglecting devotions or love has not been at the core, whatever the need is. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But as we sing the last verse and you recognize that you just really want to bring your marriage before God and pray that you can be a witness through your family, then you come as we sing. We'll pray together. How many would like to say before we pray right now, Lord, I want my home, whether you're single in your home, you may be widowed in your home, married, I want my home to be a place that will be a witness for the world because there's love there. Amen? Amen? That's where we've got to begin. This is Christianity 101. Father in heaven, Lord, I believe you've been present today as we talked about such a simple foundational truth, some practical things. Now, Lord, if I've said anything that uh, is off-center, I pray you'll forgive me and help us to catch those things that are on-center. The, the ways that we can uh, strengthen our relationships. Lord, I pray that you will bless every family. Some are doing well, some very happy, wonderful marriages. Some are struggling, whatever the case might be. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless and strengthen the homes of our families. Help us to implement some of the practical things that we've talked about and put them into practice. I pray that there will be love in our hearts. Forgive our selfishness. Might there be patience and commitment and forgiveness in our families that we can demonstrate to the world our love for one another. Bless this church, Lord. Bless the relationships represented here. Be with those who have come forward with special needs today. Fill them with your spirit and your peace. And again, we thank you for your presence here and ask that you go with us from this place. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.